Okay, um, I'll just a little introduction of who I am. I'm Charles Martin. I did my PhD at the University of Chicago in chemical physics, and I was a National Science Foundation fellow at Champaign-Urbana. And I run a boutique consulting firm in San Francisco, California, where we do machine learning, AI, data science. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've worked for a number of firms, BlackRock, Roche, uh, eBay, Aardvark, which was acquired by Google. And I also... Um, help support the Anthropocene Institute. And you may have seen my poster down, uh, and yesterday we were talking about some of the work with Broan that we've done, uh, just to try to lay down some of the um, theoretical, physical, th just just different models of, of cold fusion. But here, uh, I wanna talk about a, a tool I've developed uh, for AI that we're trying to, um, We'd like, I'd like to show you how you use it and how we've used it with some of my uh, clients and other companies that are using it to help with climate change. Now, this work has been done in collaboration with an old friend of mine who is the theoretical chemist, Michael Mahoney, who is at UC Berkeley. And he sort of convinced me, I don't know, seven, 10 years ago to start getting into AI. Basically, there are a lot of people doing AI and nobody seems to understand why it works. And, you know, we, and so we, we sort of said, look, we think we can make some progress in trying to explain why this works. And in doing this, we've developed a tool for people to use. And I want to kind of talk to you about sort of how we develop the theory and the tool and how you might be able to use it in some of the work you're doing. If you're working in climate change, um, if you're doing LENR, other, other, any particular application. So I'm going to show you what the tool is and how to use it. Um, now, you may have heard a lot about AI. There's a lot of stuff in the news about it. Uh, there was, for example, DeepMind has trained an AI to control nuclear fusion. So this is uh, the Tri-Alpha. Uh, they've been able to train this very sophisticated reinforcement learning algorithm to do this. Pretty amazing. Um, Google is also, DeepMind's also released something called um, uh, AlphaFold, which is a breakthrough in the 50-year grand challenge in theoretical chemistry to solve the protein folding problem. I I'm a little proud here because this is actually work done by my graduate advisor and his student, John Jumper, and they sort of published the first papers on this. And then... Google hired Jumper. Jumper taught them how to do protein folding. And then now they've basically solved the problem. And they've released, they're, I think they're going to release protein structures now for every known protein. Some, you know, millions of proteins. So it's pretty amazing what you can do. And there's just been a tremendous advance 10 years, the past 10 years in AI. And you have to realize that prior to about 10 years ago, people who were doing neural networks were considered ba basically crackpots that the stuff couldn't possibly work. The theoretician said it could not possibly work. There's no way, it, it was just a dead field. And now, you know, it's now solving some of the world's hardest problems, nuclear fusion, protein folding. And in fact, recently there was a Google engineer who was fired because the AI is so good at, at, at interacting with you that he thought it had become sentient. And was arguing that, you know, the AI has feelings and it's upset. You know, of course it's, it's just an it's just a computer algorithm, right? It, it's not a living thing, but you know, so it, it really is amazing what can be done. And, and I think one of the things that's quite remarkable is that if you talk to people in the academic world, you know, the guy they would statisticians, machine learning theorists, they basically say to you, "This doesn't make any sense at all. How could this possibly work?" There's they have this theory. It's called uh, you know, statistical learning theory, vapnik shrevenikas theory, and this is a, a, a very famous cartoon that the machine learning theorists, the statisticians have no idea why AI works. Um, and they, the engineers are basically like, we don't, we don't care, it works. You know, we just stack more layers, it works. And they're able to do these amazing things. And, and I would say even right now, our theoretical understanding of why these neural networks work is very, very, it, it's coming together, but it's not at all obvious what's going on. And, and if you don't know why something works, you can't really turn it into a full-fledged engineering discipline. And this is sort of my, and our argument that you have to really have some way of understanding how things work and how to diagnose problems. Otherwise you can't move from science to engineering. So it's really critical to have some very fundamental understanding of being able to make predictions about what you're doing. And I, and I don't mean explanations, I mean predictions. So I started working on this problem. I had done my you know, PhD work in theoretical chemistry and physics. And, and there's a very famous quote from one of the, our books that says, Ludwig Boltzmann spent much of, his life, much of his life studying statistical mechanics and died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on his work, died similarly in 1933. 
Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. So <laughs> this is not an easy field to work in. I, I took graduate statistical mechanics three times. I started taking it when I was like an undergraduate and I took it over and over and over. It's a very complicated field, but our theory uses ideas from statistical mechanics, but it also uses new concepts from quantum field theory. And actually a lot of the work I did with Anthropocene on this project, I had to reteach myself quantum field theory to really understand fundamentally what, you know, what is going on. And by doing that, I sort of, you know, sort of said, you know, maybe I can apply some of these techniques to AI and it's turned out to be very successful. And, and so the theory is somewhat sophisticated. You know, we've had to work out a journalized theory. We're working on a paper. It's taken me about three years to work this out. We're very close now to having this published. I mean, we're pretty sure now that, it, that it's correct, but it's a fairly sophisticated theory. And as a result, it's somewhat difficult to publish because you have to find the right reviewer. So we've been very lucky to have one of the um, top theoretical physicists and quants in the world sort of look at our paper and discuss it. But we're almost ready to publish this. I'd, I'm, I'm shooting for the end of the summer. I can show anyone who's interested, I can show you. More importantly, though, prior to doing the theory, because we have known about the theory for a long time, this is, you know, stuff from my childhood in a sense. We were able to publish a paper in Nature um, where we can predict trends in the quality of state-of-the-art neural networks without access to testing or training data. So we're very lucky. I, I had a very wonderful intern who worked with me over the summer. I did this work with no funding, no academic affiliation. Mike, Michael's been, in, I mean, other than Michael, which is an informal affiliation. So we were able to publish, it's been very successful. Um, and this has really opened up a lot of doors because we've been able to show to people our theory works. We can make specific predictions about things that are in, people are using in industry and our work is 100% reproducible. So this has been very, and it, it's been, um, it's been great to get this, this kind of attention. But again, the goal is you have to make a theory has to be put into a tool and the tool has to be usable. In fact, I think there's a famous electrical engineer, um, Carver Mead who said every useful experiment, you know, every useful measurement eventually becomes a tool for engineers to use. So this is what we've built. And so this is why I want to kind of show you what you can do with it. One of the applications, I don't have it in the slide of the tool. One of the applications, we have a company uh, called Carbon Crop, which is using the tool to help train neural networks to classify your forest. If you own some land, they use their AI to look at your land and then give you an assessment to determine whether you're eligible for carbon credits or not. And um, I, I know the engineer just, he's always, he, he's been very helpful to say, look, your stuff works great. You can use the tool to help train your AI and really get it to that level of accuracy that you need. And, that, and that's really what the tool is. So I'm just gonna kind of explain how it works. And, and people sort of think I'm crazy that you could do this, that you could actually determine how well a neural network would work without ever looking at the data. But, you know, if you think about other applications, like if you're a quant in finance, you know, you're trying to predict the markets, you can't peek at the data. If you peek at the data, you overfit. And, and there are a number of problems, and I think LNR is a good example, where you don't have a lot of data. You have a little bit, I mean, not like millions and millions of data points. So you need to be able to have tools that will help you train your models without looking at the data. So what we do is, is sort, of, sort of like, you can think of it like as an oscilloscope for a neural network that we take the neural network. Neural network basically is a structure where you have some data feeds in, you have some labels you're trying to predict, you know, does this thing. You might, you might imagine an example would be, I have some SEM images of um, palladium hydrogen samples. And maybe you have these, maybe some of them uh, exhibit LENR, maybe some of them don't. You could train a neural network to look at the image and pick out wh which one does and which one doesn't. This is something that would be critical if you're ever, I think if you're ever gonna move this to engineering and production, because you've gotta be able to do quality uh, analysis on your samples. So this is what people are doing in industry now with these tools. So our tool allows you to look at each, each layer has a matrix associated with it. You compute the eigenspectrum of the matrix and you look at, this, you look at these plots. And what you find is that when the system is learning, the, the eigenspectrum, the empirical spectral density becomes more, more power law. And this is something which is, exhibits something from physics called a strongly correlated system. A lot of people in LENR think that these are strongly correlated systems. And this is a signature of a strongly correlated system. The more correlated the system is, the more information the AI has learned, the better it will perform. And we've been able to show this empirically. 
So, for example, we can take a series of models. You might imagine this is some vision model you've trained for your project. There are various models you've trained with, you know, 11, you know, with more and more layers. And we can systematically show that as the models get larger, you can predict which one will perform better. Larger is better. Our, our smaller is better. So the smaller the alpha, the more accuracy you get. And we can systematically do this. We've done this on hundreds of models. We've done it. We were actually the first ones to do a meta-analysis on hundreds of models. And, and to give you an idea how publishing works, we submitted this paper to NIPS, NURIPS, which is the major AI conference. And they rejected it. said, well, we don't want your paper. It's too empirical. You don't have a theory. Okay. Then we submitted to Nature. And Nature's like, oh, this is great. This is real science. Then NIPS has a contest. Say, we want to we wanna have a contest for people to predict generalization. So in other words, we submitted a paper, they reject it, then they set up a contest to do exactly what we did in the Nature paper. But we published before the contest. So, you know, it, it, there, there's a, a very much a, almost a, um, a bias toward doing experiments when you don't have a theory. So we, have, we do have, we have an experiment, we have a theory. It's, it's just, uh, it, it's complicated. Here's another example of how we can use the model. You, a lot of times when you do AI, you may need to go and find some pre-trained model and pick one that's relevant for your project. So there's a, a, a place called Hugging Face. That when we started this project, there were only 50 pre-trained models widely available. Now there are 54,000. And there's a company called Hugging Face. They have a billion-dollar valuation. They have all these models. You can use our tool. You can select the models, uh, select, maybe you pick five or six models you think might be relevant for what you're doing, and our tool will tell you which one will perform better. So here's an example of comparing the Google model, which is BERT in blue, to the Microsoft model, Exonet, which is red. And it's known in the literature that Exonet outperforms BERT on at least 20 different tasks. But most people use BERT. You know, it's got a nice name, Ernie and BERT, you know, the Seven Simi Street stuff, and it's Google. But it turns out Excelnet is much, much better um, on a number of tasks. Uh, and, and our theory shows us we just run this calculation. This takes, you know, maybe an hour, maybe 20 minutes to run. And you can see that our metric, is, remember, smaller is better. So it's much more concentrated around three and a half. You know, the, the mean value is, is much smaller. And we don't have all these outliers. So you get this is basically, you know, you get this out of the box. So you can use this tool to select models that may be useful to you. You can also use it for a lot of people who are trying to build models and put them in production. This is an example from Intel, where they're trying to put models in, you know, basically they basically have to put the model inside a car. So they take these big models and they try to compress them. And we're able to show sometimes when you take the model, the green is the baseline, the red is compressed. When you compress it, it somehow breaks it. So we can see layer by layer if you introduce a break. Now, for us, we're the only theories that I know that can actually look at a model layer by layer and give you a diagnostic. If you're going to build an engineering system, you have to be able to manage risk. You have to know if your system's going to break or not when you put it in production. So we have the ability to look at these models and tell you, is this system working correctly or did you do something to it that would cause it to break? And so our theory allows us you to do this. And again, this is straight out of the box, out of the tool. Um, I, I won't go into the, there. I won't go into this part. There's uh, here's here's an example. There's some examples of people doing things in industry. Here's a fellow who's working at a hedge fund, and they're training models to predict the market. And one of the things that happens is when you train the model for long periods of time, it starts to degrade. So here's a plot where you're training the model, and it's getting better and better and better. But if you look at its predictive capacity, it gets good, good, good. And then all of a sudden, it starts going up, and it, right at this point. And then he saw he ran our, ran our theory. Our theory predicts that. Training would degrade at alpha equals two. He, he says ex at exactly alpha equals two is where the validation law starts increasing. I don't know what model he ran, because, but he showed this to me. Like, that's incredible that you were able to see this. He, 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 this is basically someone who sent me data from a, a hedge fund using this to try to, again, develop market models. And the problem being, of course, if you peek forward at the data, you'll overfit. So um, this is how the tool works. It's very simple. If you're a Python programmer, um, it analyzes the fat tails in your deep neural networks and tells you whether you're working or not. If you're trying to build AI models for any of your research, you're trying to build classifiers to see if your LNR systems are working, use the tool, pip install Weight Watcher, import Weight Watchers WW, make the watcher, give it your model, and say analyze. It will give you a summary and results. And you, you know, 
you can reach out to me to help you anal to help analyze the results and see how they work. Um, all the words, can, all this work is again 100% reproducible. We have a GitHub page to describe it. We have a Slack channel if you want to look if you want to get some additional help. And again, this work has been published in top journals, JMLR, Nature, and we're hoping to submit a paper soon to um, uh, FizRevX on the theory. So I'll stop there and ask if anyone has any questions. Uh, go ahead. Well, there is a group at Google which has been able to solve a high school level physics problems. It's quite amazing. It can read the physics problem and it will actually parse the equations and then work out the equations for you. So that's the level that we're at. I, I don't know if it'll come up with equations, but you certainly could say, here's our data. Here are the models that we think work and show L and R, show XS heat. Here are the ones that don't. The AI can look at your data and and predict which one will and which one will not. So then if you manufacture, you know, you make another core, you make another device, you just give it to the AI and it will tell you this this material will exhibit L and R, this material will not exhibit L and R. And, and that's totally doable today with, off the with these off-the-shelf tools, computer vision, pre-trained models. That's not, that's not a year of work. I mean, that's actually a fairly straightforward calculation if you have some of the, yeah, if you have an intern or a student who really understands Python and knows how to run these tools. So that's totally doable. Other, uh, Carl. Yeah, so you're describing the system for pattern recognition. Um, does it extend also to like inductive learning where the system has to experiment on the world? Well, I, I think people are trying to make models that are inductive where you have uh, Lee Kun, who is the um, head of AI at Facebook, has come up with a world model where you, you have a model, it does some exploration, and then it has like a... Um, a model of the world and it tries to use that model of the world to then do more learning. So these are fairly complex systems where you have sort of a sort of a, a model of the mind where you have these different components and you know, each part, this is your world, this is your world model of the mind, this is your reasoning system, this is your reinforcement learning system. And people are trying to build, you know, complete systems that can do that. So not an easy task, but uh, people are trying. Uh, anyone? Uh, I'm I'm trying to get I'm trying to get this product off the ground as as a, like a SaaS product that we can offer to people. So we're focused totally on that. Um, but I'm happy to, I, I you know it's it's exciting stuff. Jan, you had a question? Sure. Um, so I'm wondering um, the 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 distributions that you see in overfitted um, layers are heavy tailed, right? As well as the ones that are correctly fitted if, if you can go back a few slides i'll explain that okay I, i'm guessing there's a difference in there there is can, can you guys yeah. go back one more go one more right here okay so in why are overfitted models off of heavy tailed so in statistical learning theory what you're trying to do is come up with a bound the bat so if you have here's a model that works correctly and the green is a layer that's strongly correlated and if you permute the layer, you just permute all the elements, you get this, you get the red, you get this nice semicircular plot, which is exactly predicted by random matrix theory. There are cases when you train these models that if you understand that there's something called a regularizer, the regularizer fails and you get sort of large elements in the W matrix, but they're not correlations. So we call them correlation traps. So what you would see is sort of a large element, this sort of yellow line here. If you, if you take the weight matrix, permute it, and then compute its eigenvalue spectrum, you see something like a rank one perturbation, which arises outside. It should, this, should, this line should be at the edge, not out here. This causes the structure of the correlation matrix to change. And it, see, the correlation matrix now looks almost random, but then it has this little shelf out here, which we call a trap. So we have a, in our new paper, and I have a blog post where I show this, I can actually systematically train a model, a very, like a one layer toy, like a hydrogen atom example, where we can induce the trap. And when you induce the trap, it causes the accuracy to drop. 
So this is essentially why what we're doing, and that's an excellent question, because if these traps arise, it makes your system look like it's more heavy tailed than it should be. So the tool has has a um, the Weight Watcher tool has a method called um, SVD sharpness, which is like a pack bounce transfer, which will remove the traps for you. But it's equivalent. That's that's an excellent question. Someone who really uh, really knows what's going on. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. All right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it.